A few months ago, I was walking down the stairs at home, and I heard my six and a half year old son scream at his sister, I don't want to lose my legs. Panicked, I asked what was going on. Turns out he had been picking his scab, and his sister had told him the story she overheard me sharing a few days before about a little girl called Addie who had picked her, innocently picked her scab and had ended up in hospital. Five, and five months later was a recipient of a lung transplant and was wheelchair bound. You see, Addie's scab had become infected and the infection that spread to Addie's bloodstream in a matter of days, she'd become lethargic and feverish. She was rushed into hospital with sepsis. The problem was that the bacteria that infected Addie were highly resistant to antibiotics. She suffered one complication after another and needed a lung, the lobe lung transplant. When she emerged from the hospital five months later with her mom, she was wheelchair bound. I was deeply moved by this story because, you see, when I watched the documentary, I was an antimicrobial pharmacist in a hospital, thinking about my job and the responsibility I had, and also my two children, I felt the responsibility to do even more. Antimicrobials is the term we use for medicines that kill organisms and inhibit the growth of organisms. Antibiotics fight bacteria. Antivirals fight viruses. Antifungals, you get the idea. But they all come under the umbrella term of antimicrobials. And bugs developing resistance to these agents has become a, pro a huge problem in the UK and abroad. The reason for this is because all these organisms grow at an alarming rate. And through natural selection, those organisms that naturally carry some resistance to these drugs grow, proliferate, and survive. And ultimately, they give rise to a new strain of, of bacteria which become resistant to those antibi antimicrobial drugs. You can't have missed the headlines recently. Superbug to kill 10 million. Antibiotics useless in 12 years. Woman dies from bacteria resistant to all infections, to all, infection resistant to all antibiotics. And the most recent one, Candida auris, a fungi which has caused outbreaks all over the world. You might just be wondering, is this all scaremongering? I can tell you that it is not. Antimicrobial resistance is listed on the UK risk register alongside pandemic flu and terrorism, and it is there for a reason. Around 700,000 people around the world die yearly already from drug-resistant infections. This includes tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, but also urinary tract infections. If no action is taken now, a review completed by the economist Lord G. Moniel has estimated that drug-resistant infections will kill 10 million people every single year by 2050. And these will be more deaths than those that are caused by cancer. In the UK, we already see more than 5,000 deaths each year as a direct result of infections that are caused by bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. What would life be like without antibiotics? If I ask in this room now, one in three of us would have taken an antibiotic this year. And in hospital, one in three patients are on antibiotics at any one time. So just imagine if we were in a situation where antibiotics no longer work. This would mean that simple cuts will once again kill, and that's a huge risk. We have over three million surgical operations, like caesarean sections, but we also have cancer treatments, which will become life-threatening without antibiotics. This is being referred to as the post-antibiotic era. We know that antibiotics happen through natural occurrences, and when we need antibiotics, it is important that we take them to combat those infections. However, when we take antibiotics, when we don't need them because we don't have a bacterial infection, for example, what we are doing is putting, we're having, we're putting uh, occurrences in our systems and growing, um, allowing bacteria which are resistant to, um, to antibiotics to grow for no justified reason. 
And then you might be wondering exactly what is the government, pharmaceutical industry, and world leaders doing about this? And is there anything that you can do? Well, let me start with the governments and the international institutions. Across the world in 2016, 193 heads of states, so not just health ministers, the heads of states, signed a UN declaration that they will tackle antimicrobial resistance in their country, and that they will start this by having a national action plan to tackle antimicrobial resistance. Before that declaration was made, there were only 79 countries across the world who had a national action plan in place. Since then, 93 countries now have a national action plan that is published, and 51 countries have them in development. There are now only 10 countries in the world who do not have an action plan or have it in de development, and this is a huge progress. The UK government, for example, has not only taken a lead within, on this issue through its own national action plan, but also a new 20-year vision to tackle antimicrobial resistance in the UK but it is also supporting low- and middle-income countries. For example, the Fleming Fund, which is part of UK Aid, has supported 51 of these countries to develop their national action plans. And it is also training healthcare professionals in this country. Through the same funding, the Fleming Fund, the Commonwealth Pharmacist Association is working to empower pharmacists and promote better use of antibiotics across Commonwealth countries in Africa and wider but particularly at this moment working in Ghana, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zambia. You may be wondering, why don't we just develop new antibiotics? Unfortunately, it is not so easy. There's been no true new class of antibiotics developed in the last 30 years. And when adaptations of antibiotics have been developed, resistance occurs very quickly to them. Because what is really key is that we use antibiotics appropriately. Individuals across the world have also been doing their part to, do, to, to have also been doing their part to take action. One way that I have been able to support this is through the development of an initiative called the Antibiotic Guardian, which was launched in 2014. The initiative moves us from simply raising awareness to increasing engagement. It is a call to action for the individual, and collectively we can make a difference. Breaking the massive task of tackling antimicrobial resistance into small actions so that everyone can do their part. Because we can tackle, then tackle the huge problem together. So not just healthcare professionals, but teachers, civil servants, and even school children. And why not? After hearing Addy's story, my now seven-year-old understands the point. He has recently had yet another scab, and he did not pick at it, which meant that it healed faster. The Antibiotic Guard Initiative is to be all-inclusive and enable both healthcare professionals in human and animal health and also members of the public to do something to help tackle the issue. For example, everyone can wash their hands and prevent the spread of infections. The platform, is a, the, the platform for the campaign is a website, and on the website there are a collection of pledges that you can choose from, or you can write your own. The pledges are different actions that people can take, and, and the pledges vary hugely. They're designed to be diverse, and there are pledges for vets, for students, for farmers, and also healthcare workers, and for those who have pets as well. It is a choice that people make about what pledge they choose, and it's about their commitment. Individuals and organizations can publicly sign up and also share what their pledge is. For example, a healthcare professional can pledge that when they write an antibiotic prescription, they will make sure it is in line with local guidelines. Or that when they are prescribing an antibiotic, they will tell the patient what the antibiotic is for and how to use it. And individuals can also pledge, as I said. And so you can pledge, for example, that when, if you are given an antibiotic, that the antibiotic is taken exactly as prescribed and not saved for later or shared with others. And for pet owners as well, there are pledges to keep their animals active and also vaccination. Organizations can also pledge, as I said, and TEDx London Business School has already fulfilled one of the pledges. And that by inviting me here today to share with you the dangers of antibiotic resistance and what everyone can do to do their part. We know the pledges work because we like to keep our commitments. 
My pledge was one of the family pledges. I pledged to teach my children how to wash their hands while singing the ABCD song, because this is the recommendation from World Health Organization. And so now they sing when they're washing their hands. They think twice before they leave that sink, before they get to Z. And I always watch out for that. To date, the Antibiotic Guardian website has had 70,000 pledges from across the world. And these are from individuals from the UK and 120 countries across the world. The pledges have also been translated into five different languages and through a collaboration with WHO Europe and the Belgian government. And there are country pledges, there are country pages as well for South Africa. And this week we're launching the Australian page. I've been overwhelmed by people's readiness to take their pledge to the next level and to influence the future generation. Take, for instance, Steve Morton, Sheila Snape and Ryan Armerton. And because of them, there are now Antibiotic Guardian um, scouts all over the country because they took on their pledge and went on to educate the scout members and beavers. Or Riva Ardley, who is a public health practitioner but had no clinical training, but she reached out to school nurses and, and they, together they taught school children about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. Seventy of these children designed posters which, the, which are now displayed in Wolverhampton Art Gallery to educate members of the public. Beyond schools and into higher education, a student at King's College invited us to join, collaborate with him, and he pulled together a multi-professional group of students, and they ran the first national student conference on antimicrobial resistance. Because of him, we have carried on to run that conference yearly, and there are now more than 400 students who have been directly impacted because of his pledge. These are just examples of ordinary people doing extraordinary things in the UK. But the, and, and this story is, goes wider than that, because even across the world, in Tanzania, for example, um, a pharmacist student has gone on to influence 480 other students from 21 countries, 21 regions in Tanzania, and they were running antibiotic, garden, antibiotic awareness campaigns in their homes during their vacations. I mentioned earlier that what hand washing was critical to preventing the spread of infections and controlling antimicrobial resistance. WHO and UNICEF have been taking action through an initiative called WASH, which is water, sanitation, and hygiene. And together with them and their partners, they have committed to address the situation where, for example, 1.5 billion people do not have access to clean water. And one in six healthcare facilities across the world do not have clean water or hand washing facilities. Businesses and charities have also been supporting the cause. The Science Museum, for example, has not only led the Superbug Museum exhibition in the UK, but they've also done it across China and in India as well. I'm going to leave you with a tale of theatrical mold. Not so long ago, I heard of a young father who had watched a, a, a play, and he wrote to the writer of the play, about a story that he wanted to share, with the, which, is, which had happened with his son. The play was called The Mold That Changed the World, basically the story of penicillin, but it was done in a way that was understandable to children under the age of 10. He wrote that he was at the GP with his son because they thought he had an infection. The GP gave them two options. They could either start a course of antibiotics straight away or they could test to see if they were infecting organisms, and if any were found, they could start the antibiotics. He said before he could answer, his son piped up and said he preferred to be tested first. The GP asked him, is that because the taste horrible? And the son said, no, it is because he watched a show about how antibiotics were going to stop working if we used them the wrong way. Antibiotic resistance is an issue for us all. Although the government, the industry, and organizations are doing their part, we can also do our bit too, however small. And sometimes those actions shape the behavior of our children at the sink, of scouts, of university students, of seven-year-olds and their visits to the GP. What action will you take today to help keep antibiotics working for you, your family, and the future generation? I invite you to join me by choosing a pledge on the Antibiotic Guardian website today. Thank you.